of creating such a game, uh, especially in, uh, in game time. So, uh, and the point of the solving is to get to know the social structure and uh, that we can understand it. Um, and it's important in biochemistry uh, because there are the primary chemicals for almost all the processes. So uh, we talked about the main uh, game design issues. They said that the, the biggest issue was that the uh, end state is not known. So, which it usually is in, in games. Uh, so it's made it difficult to create uh, like scoring systems and tell people how well they were doing since they don't know beforehand what the end result is going to be. It's also uh, another issue is to uh, to hide the complex system to not uh, overwhelm new players who don't have any knowledge of what the coding is or how it works. And uh, yeah, to, to hide unimportant information and uh, make it approachable to those players. So they also, uh, the part of that is also to make it look, look fun and inviting. So they use bright colors and uh, playful in the um, so, uh, And uh, yeah, there's uh, there's, also, there's lots of issues with like the visual in itself uh, to help players uh, see solutions and like accurate uh, on this like complex issue without them having any knowledge about. It. Um, so we talk yeah very little about architecture, uh, which you can see there. It's pretty basic uh, client server architecture. Uh, each user has a client and uh, downloads problems from the server that the site is post. Um, <coughs> they can also form groups and, uh, and chat. And there's a leaderboard uh, which scores both for people working alone and people working in, in groups. Um, for the development game, they used uh, an interactive strategy, uh, which is basically they got feedback both from players and experts in the field. Uh, from players is to make the game understandable for them and make it fun and to kind of narrow the scope to the issues that the players can actually help with. And, and they don't need experts to, to make sure that the game actually produces uh, actual valuable scientific results. Um, and they also say that they've continued this uh, development after the game is released so they can continue from players and include the game that way. Uh, um, so, yeah, this then the good part of the uh, game we're talking about, like, yeah, it's like about scoring and about introduction levels, which is kind of basic game design, I would say. Like, introduction levels is it's basically tutorials, which is in, in almost all games these days. Um, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the scoring, uh, as we saw in that video, is uh, since they don't know what the end goal is, uh, they don't know the maximum score. And so the scoring is uh, determined by some variables, I guess. But uh, they don't know what the top score is. So the players are kind of, they are more determining how how high you can get, because they're just scored uh, in relation to each other. Um, yeah, to uh, test how good uh, the solutions are, the ones that the players found, they were entered into a competition called 
people who cast hate that version of DOM, something, uh, which is a, a competition for uh, for the structure prediction methods. And um, yeah, uh, there is a table to scroll down there of how good they did. This basically, they, they did uh, some of the folder solutions did uh, did rank pretty high in that competition. And this competition is for the supporting structures that they actually sold in all these are the ones that are not sold yet. Uh, or we don't know the optimal structure. But for this competition, there are they use uh, proteins that where the structure is either known or is going to be known pretty soon, but it's not published. So so they can uh, see how close people get. And you see the folder graph is some of them are pretty high considering these are people who have no no uh, experience or not know anything about about what we're talking about. So, so uh, yeah. Um, for uh, for the conclusion, they uh, yeah they basically just conclude that it, it's possible to make a game like this and uh, make a game that's uh, that has fun gameplay that's a fun experience for the user, uh, even though they don't know really what the, anything about that sort of issue that they're solving. Uh, but it's we don't make any conclusion about the 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 protein folding itself probably because it's kind of small sample size. Uh, and, uh, so how how they designed the um, the concept itself. So how? Um, yeah, what, what I would like you to tell a little bit more about is this. Uh, the design process for making the game. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they start by talking to experts. Uh, um, yeah, well, yeah. They start by talking to experts in the field to just to make sure that the game produces uh, uh, useful discoveries. Uh, so they worked closely with them during the initial development, and then once they had a prototype, they they uh, introduced players and had them had them play it and uh, give feedback on just how if it's understandable and uh, and if it's fun. This has something fun doing its game, and uh, the and the players also helped them uh, understand the. Kind of game mechanics they needed to implement, and uh, yeah, these players continued to test it through a process, and also after it was released, they continued to give feedback. Yeah, so it, it takes quite a number of iterations to get that sort of the the game mechanic aligned with the actual experiments and with the real physical outputs which the the game produces. Because in isolation, you can quite easily make a game which produces something, but that may not necessarily be aligned with the uh, physical reality of, of the game. So all those three groups were crucial to get the, 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 the whole system right. Uh, if one of those elements was not there, it wouldn't be possible to, to do that correctly. Uh, So I will talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, any questions for Henrik? We can check the questions for the article. Oops. All right.
So the first two questions got sort of relatively high scores. How does Folded apply to visualizations recommended for scientific discovery games? Reflect and illuminate the natural rules of the system, manage and hide the complexity of the system approachable by players. So, yeah, so the... the uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot about uh, hiding the complexity of the system, uh, with simplifying it and only showing uh, the players the, uh, the information that they need to solve, uh, solve the problem. Um, just to avoid that they become overwhelmed because they don't know anything about it for you. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, so one one aspect of that is the you you have to make it the game. So naturally, you are not a microbiologist. You don't know a lot about protein folding, but you know a little bit about three-dimensional geometry and about relationships, and you kind of translate the actual problem space into a space which the players sort of understand. And that's one aspect of it, that, that, that translation already. And the other one is, as you've seen on the video, they had different modes of operating on the, on the protein structure. So you can have the whole picture with all the little elements kind of displayed, or you can uh, hide all the details and just have the backbone of the, of the protein itself showing up and everything else being kind of hidden from view. So if you are a novice player, you can hide everything and just focus on the basic structure of the, of the backbone of the protein. And then a, as you progress, you can keep adding additional elements um, onto, the, onto the gameplay and visualize them and, and see them. So physically, all those elements are being taken, uh, taken care of into the calculations of the actual energy of the, of the folded protein. But when you're playing it, you can hide that complexity and just play with the backbone itself and don't actually manage that. So that's another element they've used. And then the third element is you had those automated processes which do things for you. So you can start in some c configuration and then press a button and the computer will minimize the energy by pulling things together automatically and making sure that you collapse to the minimal state, to the local minima. And then once you reach the local minima, you can then manipulate the protein and see if you can escape it and reach another optima which is local again. And by jumping from those local optima, you can search the search space yourself, but you are not forced to tediously manipulate it to reach that minima. It's the computer who kind of does it for you. So they've used cleverly those three elements to limit the complexity for the players, which the players have to deal with. Uh, otherwise, it would have been almost impossible to do that manually, uh, to reach those levels of of, um, um, of protein folding which the players could achieve with the aid of the computer. Yeah, so there is, um, in relation to the first one, getting the, the three components correct and getting the gameplay correct, I want also to show you uh, who knows the Galaxy Zoo. Um, so Galaxy Zoo is another uh, crowdsourcing science game sort of thing. Um, so the astronomers g took a lot of photographs of the sky and they recorded l a large number of images. It's like a, one million or, or more images which they would spend years going through and classifying and organizing into some sort of taxonomy. So instead they released all those images to the public and you kind of browse the images and you have to classify what sort of galaxy you see. So they teach you a little bit about different types of galaxies, so you can uh, see what sort of um, um, galaxies they are. So they are the smooth galaxies, and then you have some example pictures of how the smooth galaxies look like. And then you have the um, different, s different shapes of the smooth galaxies. So you have the cigar shape and the um, circular ones. And then if you pick... Um, if you pick, yeah, I can't, how can I go back? Restart, probably. 
Yeah. So if I restart and pick another type, again I can uh, see examples of uh, of these ones. Um, so you you kind of get a little bit of a tutorial by going it through that yourself, and then you being shown images and you start classifying them. Right? It seems kind of natural, and then you can calculate statistics of how people did their selection and you can hope for getting some of the classifications done right. So some of the galaxies which are smooth you would get classified as smooth and some galaxies which are spiral you would get as spiral. So they run the experiment for half a year or so they classified yeah, half a million of photos and it turned out the majority of the galaxies were right-handed instead of being balanced between right-handed and left-handed and there is no reason for that scientifically all the galaxies are sort of either that way or that way and the images should statistically be showing that but the experiment didn't so they had some trouble of making sense out of this what what happened and um, what happened <coughs> I can show you a short video <laughs> It's a little bit foggy, you know. Sorry for this. All right. So I'm talking with Chris Lintot, who is an astronomer at the University of Oxford, and he's with Galaxy Zoo. And I'll let him explain what Galaxy Zoo is. Galaxy Zoo is the world's largest astronomy collaboration. We have uh, pictures of a million galaxies taken by a robotic telescope. And the first thing we need to do is look at them to sort out these galaxies into various types. And we invited the public to log on to galaxies.org and help us out. And they've done that in spades, haven't they? They've classified quite a few galaxies. Yeah, we've had over 100,000 people look at just about 40 million images so far in six months. So we thought this is going to, was going to take years to do, and instead it's taken over my life and we're, we're not doing much else. And they're classifying the galaxies by spiral type and by elliptical type. Yeah, there's two simple questions. The first one is, is this a big ball of stars and elliptical, or is this a nice, beautiful spiral galaxy? If it's a spiral galaxy, which way are the arms pointing? And the idea is that that tells you about which way the galaxy is rotating. So if it's spinning clockwise or, or counterclockwise, anticlockwise, as I believe you say in England. We do, yeah. We haven't realized anticlockwise needed translating for the Americans on the site, but <laughs> nonetheless. And you expect to see just as many clockwise as counterclockwise, so, right? When you look at the whole sky, or a quarter of the sky as we do, when you take an average across that huge area, you should see an equal number. And the scary thing was we didn't see that. We saw more galaxies spinning anti-clockwise than clockwise. And that makes no sense whatsoever. You have to start throwing away all sorts of cosmological principles to account for this. So that makes no sense. And this has been going on for quite some time. I wrote about this, and a lot of people have written about it. And we were wondering what could possibly be causing this. And it seems that it's possible that you found the solution. Yeah, we're, we're fairly sure now that we, we know where the solution lies. What we've been doing for the last uh, month and a half or so is showing, tricking people. We've been showing people mirror images of the galaxies. So if this is a real effect in the universe, you should then see more clockwise rather than anti-clockwise. The effect should reverse. And in the data that we're releasing on our blog today, or that we're talking about, we don't see that. People are off. The universe is involved. There seems to be something about the way people use our site that makes them more likely to click the anti-clockwise button. <laughs> now, that could just be our site design, so we need to test that next. Or it could be telling us something about how people perceive images. So I'm going to have to go and get a second career in psychology, I think, to work out just what's going on here. So the fault lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. Absolutely. <laughs> the universe is fine. <laughs> well, I could have told you that in the first place. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Chris. That's Chris Lintoff from the University of Oxford and Galaxy Zoo. What's the URL for this? Yeah. So you can see that to the original triangle, you also would have to include the the way people. So in in a way, the game design team is having some psychology people in there and they know how people interact with the systems. They, they knew how to design it so then it's sort of um, mental models of people and the models which they wanted to achieve were aligned. Whereas in this experiment they only had sort of the scientists and the players. They didn't have people actually doing the 
the design and doing the interaction design and doing the psychology of interactions. And they just perceptual part, perceptual part exactly. And it just biased the results. Not because the data was like that, just because the interaction was biased by, by human um, perceptions. So that that is kind of really tricky to get right uh, because you can have certain biases in the game itself which you may not spot initially but they they will de you know completely derail the experiment uh, which you're trying to achieve. They haven't yet. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of they did a number of experiments and they tried to kind of uh, play with the orders and play with the mirror imaging and so on, but it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly why people perceive certain things certain way. Um, it's like with those visual illusions, possibly, with the perceptions sometimes. Do you remember, how, what, what's the idea of um, point structure? They get points for number of galaxies they classify or yeah, I think it's just because the sheer number. I think yeah. there is some psychology going on that might be similar to what we saw once when they had lots of people coming in to log images. There were lots of images, historical images that some photographers from the 18th century were taking photos, and they got these huge boxes of uh, of images, and they put them up on the on the server, and wanted all Norwegians to be able to use the images, but images without Keywords for for, mm -hmm. for searches was, was quite hard, and there weren't many keywords, of course, because it's in this world. So they hired lots of people from the street to come in and just tag what you see in the image, and they could you could search on based on content. Content. Now I find it quite interesting because uh, when I looked at these records, I found things like telephone poles were everywhere, even though telephone poles was not important in that picture, because what I think and never proved it, but what is happening is that when you get paid to do a certain job, you want to do it fast, mm -hmm. and the fastest way is that you recognize objects that you've seen before. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to recognize telephone pole if you just if the telephone pole was important in a couple of images, and and you know that you, you know, in that case I think you, you wouldn't be happy until you had four or five or six or seven keywords or tags, uh, and if the if you run out or if it was you saw a telephone pole right away, you get done with it. So I think once speed is important, mm. I think you get into that pattern matching. And mm. if you have seen or, or or you see one spiral more easily, I think it is over representing. So, uh, it's possible. so I think it has something to do with the, with the incentive uh, structure. Yeah, but if you if you uh, give points for being quick. Mm. Doing this, I think you get into a quick and dirty, matching mode. <laughs> yeah, it's it's possible. I, I I think they could. Yeah, I don't know. Um, they could align the speed with the accuracy as well. So if you are quick but you misclassified things, you get negative points. So then you would have to balance your accuracy with with the yeah, speed. Yeah. That is important. All right. So that was the first um, the first article and actually the first question which we went through. So, so what are the, some specific challenges in game design when designing scientific discovery games? So we did cover some of those. We discussed it and that was also one of the highly ranked questions. It goes beyond that particular article. So that, that question is generic enough and it applies to, to all sorts of um, scientific discovery games. Um, and it is really difficult to get it right. So with the protein folding, they were lucky enough that the spatial arrangements and the, the way you play the game actually aligns really well with the problem domain. Uh, it is a three-dimensional sort of a functional problem space where you have to arrange elements uh, in a certain fashion. And it sort of seems to work. Um, there not everybody is good at it. So they discovered that, they, of course, there are players who play this folded game and they're excellent, and there are people who tried it and they just cannot go beyond a certain level and they can't progress. So there are certain psychological traits and certain skills which some people have and some don't. Um, so I have another short video um, 
which I can play you, which talks a little bit about it. Um, when, yep. Technology. Play. So my name is Adrian Troy, and I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm going to talk to you about how knowledge creation is going to change over the next coming decades, and I think it's going to profoundly change. And the situation is actually not that different from computation. Fifty years ago, if you wanted to get access to computation, you had to go to a university or a big corporation. You couldn't do it any other way. And now, as Sergey put so eloquently last night, uh, we have more computation in each one of our pockets. The same thing is happening with knowledge creation today. Uh, uh, you know, the knowledge creation is dominated by big universities and large corporations, which create the world's theories and products. But I think that in the future, we're going to find knowledge creation uh, spread throughout uh, all of society and really generated by ad hoc networks of people on the internet. OK. So what do I mean by this? Let me give you an example. Protein folding. Protein folding is one of the key challenges in biology today, and it's typically done in large universities uh, on supercomputers. And a couple of years ago, some colleagues of mine and I set out to see if we could find a completely different model. So the protein that you see here isn't being folded by some supercomputer. It's being folded by an 11-year-old boy in upstate New York. And this is a game which we created called Fold It. And in fact, this boy is one of over 100,000 Fold It players around the world who are competing and collaborating to fold proteins. Let me give you another example. This is a nano engineering interface that we came up with for a game called Eternum, which takes the Fold It <coughs> idea to one step further. So uh, what happens here is players design molecules, but then they select which molecules they think are best. And then we automatically synthesize these molecules and send back the experimental results to players, which scores their efforts and in high throughput biochemistry. And the thing about this is that players are actually fantastic at this. So when we started this experiment, the players were not doing very well. They're the red dots there. To be honest, the computers weren't doing that well either. But through this sort of cycle of experimental feedback, over the course of six months, 30,000 non-expert Eterna players got better and better at nanoengineering to the point that their worst solution was better than the best computer solution. Okay. Even more excitingly, we've been able to ask the players how they're doing this. So this is a pattern which was unknown to science. It's highly predictive of whether or not an RNA is going to fold. Okay, so this is, this is serious science. We published nature papers based on what these players have done. But this is just the beginning. And so I want to take this talk to extrapolate these ideas a little bit into the future. And the first thing I want to talk about is training. So both Fold and Eterna were highly based on tutorial levels which taught people the, uh, basically the biophysics required to solve these problems. And it's, it's very interesting uh, that we can do that. It's a whole other story. But what I want to concentrate on is that this has allowed us to filter through hundreds of thousands of people on the web and find those who are experts at these very esoteric tasks. And in the future, I can imagine that as grand challenges emerge, we can come up with games and puzzles that uh, essentially exploit the skills required and find at a very fine-grained level people who are experts at these kinds of problems. And I'll tell you, the person who owns this network owns something very, very valuable, knowing all this expertise. The second thing I want to talk about is big data. So we all know that we're in the midst of the big data revolution. And uh, it's very real. And the question is, what role do humans have to play in this uh, type of computer science? And so to make this more concrete, suppose I gave you a million images. And I asked you to, to use them to train a computer to find an object in the image. So for example, find this tiger in, inside this image. 
This is the you know, object recognition problem. People have worked for decades on this. It's devilishly hard. They've come up with all sorts of advanced techniques, such as active classification, discriminative learning of relaxed hierarchies, multi-class boosting, self-paced learning, uh, max product belief propagation. Now, I'm not going to go into these now, because I presume that you guys are familiar with all of this. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> the point is that it doesn't actually matter so much which one of these you use. Because it turns out that vastly more important than the machine learning algorithm you use is which features you extract from the data. It turns out that if you just look at the raw pixel values in an image, it doesn't matter what you do. You'll never discover this tiger in this image. So computer scientists and statisticians and economists work very hard to extract features from data sets from which we can then do machine learning. But if you look at what this player has done, he's essentially automatically, or automatically, He's found a feature which we can use to discriminate RNA nanoengineering, right? And so when people think of crowdsourcing today, they typically think of simple image and pattern recognition tasks. But I think that this work presents a model in which large groups of people work with big data and lots of computation, actually, to solve problems at the limit of human knowledge. The final thing I want to talk about is rewards. So when we look at a game like Folded or Eternal, we have all these players which are designing these molecules, and we know exactly when every single molecule is designed, their timestamps. And by analyzing the data carefully, we can also tell who influenced whom. And we can use this to get a very fine-grained score for each player. And this isn't the coin-up score from like, you know, the coin-up machine in your diner or something. You guys are probably too young to know about this. But uh, this is a very, very fine-grained score that we can use for collaboration and competition. If you take this idea of score and turn it into uh, the idea of money, all of a sudden we have a very fine-grained way of paying people for intellectual labor. And I think that this model can really upend the way that the economics of intellectual labor today. So let me give you an example. Why is it when you go to Ford, do you buy an entire car, right? Why isn't it that you just buy thousands of different components from different individual makers and pay someone to assemble them into a completely custom car. Okay. So this question is basically, why do corporations exist? And it was solved in... Yeah, so he goes a little bit off topic um, into the, the, the bigger picture of, of things. So the, the kind of relevant things were the... Um, yeah, his, his main point was about the, the way crowdsourcing can play the role in, in knowledge generation. And then there was the um, the description of folded. And then the first thing, which was kind of interesting, was the difference between folded and uh, um, Eterna. Because here, the whatever the players produce has to go to the lab. They have to try to create it. And if they can, then the player gets points. If it is physically impossible to do that, then the you know the model is is broken. So it's not purely computational. Uh, crowdsourcing, it's crowdsourcing of models which then are actually physically verified in the lab. And if those uh, RNA mole molecules can be, you know, assembled in the, in the structure which um, the players kind of designed, then the players get, get scores out of that. So that the, the mechanic and the, the scoring is slightly different to the way uh, the folded works, because in folded you can calculate the energy level of the protein model and on base on that, you can score the, the player automatically. So it's, you know, exclusively in, in silico, you, you can say. Here, the, the in silico simulations kind of are bridged together with the in vitro sim simulations because the, uh, the person, the, the actual uh, molecular biologist has to try to do that uh, and verify if that model is physically real, realizable. So that was the second interesting thing. The third one was that um, they <coughs> the, the training of people and the ability to beat the computer uh, simulations. So that, that was kind of an interesting point that initially there was almost no difference and the computers were doing kind of okay. But the computers continue doing the same uh, even though the, the players kind of curve was getting higher. And as he was saying, some people are ex extremely good in those, uh, in some of the tasks, and they can spot certain patterns which the computers can't. 
Uh, and that was sort of the main point of, of, of which I thought very interesting here, that th that's what, you know, computers are not good at. That's why, where we need human kind of ingenuity and, and intelligence and kind of sense of discovery uh, to find those certain rules and certain patterns which then can be used to build the solutions. So then he talked a little bit about, I don't remember where in video that was, but about the uh, extraction of rules. So it was not only about finding something, but it was also about finding how that was found, finding the, those patterns. And uh, in the previous video, they talked about this toolkit where you can automate certain things of how you discovered, how you're working. Uh, so they try to do that, they try to kind of learn how the players work, how the player's mind works. So then they can build automated systems which sort of try to achieve the same thing. So yeah, so that was a little bit of a detour um, about the, the second question. Uh, which architecture is generally used for scientific discovery games on the basis of used architecture describe the general principle of of the game folded. So who asked that question? Yeah, so what, what do you think the answer might be? Uh, usually uh, we use clean server architecture and on the basis we can build a folded game where we can test and server and Clients and also the researchers mm -hmm. who can the system. It was described. Yeah, so you're talking more about this this architecture here. Yeah. What strategies were used to find the problems that users face during the game? Yes? Yes. Yep, so what, what do you think the answer? Um, there were some uh, methods, but I don't remember exactly what were those, but uh, there were some solutions for the problems that the user found. And that was <laughs> so you, you meant, in the question, you meant the problems in the actual solving the puzzles or the problems with the game itself? Game itself. Okay, yeah. Probably what is being after says they keep track of strategy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So they used very iterative process, and we discussed that, that it's almost impossible to design it up front. You can't do that. You have to start incrementally and, and iterate over and over and over again. Um, which modeling suit is folded build on top of and what functionality does the suit provide for the game? Yes? Uh, it's built on Rosetta Home. Rosetta at home? Uh, it's Rosetta something. Yeah. of the protein yeah. models. Yeah, so the, we discussed that already as well. So the, the project wasn't started a new, there was an existing project called Rosetta at Home, which was uh, a project for actually building computationally the, uh, the proteins. And it had all the rules and all the computational mechanisms to do that. Mm -hmm. So then when they build the folded, they could use Rosetta's yeah. instead. Get, yeah, they basically gamified it, yeah. And they could use the rules and the physics and the uh, models to help players play the game. All right, so what do you think about the, the project? What do you think about this uh, type of, of games? I think it's a really good idea. Yeah. And it's obviously working. So. Yeah, like some of the articles mentioned that they actually made some actual real discoveries, that, which is, and it's worth it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, I tried it a little bit, and uh, they 
do try to make it play game ish, but uh, well, it got a bit harder pretty quickly yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I I was the same I did the tutorials and then I found it really hard to to yeah. progress yeah I think you need to know a bit more about how it really works yeah. probably as I was saying probably attracting a very special type of players these are the types of players that is really want to attract as well. Yeah. Not the casual player, but the one that is really interested in these type of puzzles. Exactly. And um, has certain skill sets yeah. as well. Yeah. The game, the Kerbal Space Program, I think NASA is currently making mods for it. It might be interesting if they actually make mods that make the game more realistic, you might end up crowdsourcing <laughs> spacecraft design, <laughs> which could be interesting to see mm. if they manage to get something that Actually, good. No. I think this is is what for all games. Uh, not all games are equally attractive to all players. So no. There's no certain games. So this is more like a custom game. So Definitely, yeah. A rewarding yeah. one for the certain genre and also certain skill skill sets. Yeah. Uh, because I like puzzle games, but. Uh, yeah, that, well, that that's beyond, yeah, yeah so, <laughs> exactly. Uh. All right, so uh, should we have a short break before the second article? All right.